field causes life. It's very simple. It's why you feel great in a stone house and you feel like mared inside of a steel house. <laughs> very simple. And if you understand that, then you know how to build a capacitor. I mean, a house that causes life. So after your architect builds your house, you measure whether the electric field is fractal or you measure whether it causes a seed to grow and then you decide if your architect gets a paycheck, right? Otherwise, so any biology department that's in a steel or aluminum building you know is stupid. Actually, it's very simple because that kind of capacitor is preventing life. So I'm going to pass these around and you just play with this very gently. Just have a little fun. Pass them around. Very slowly, p parallel to your ears. Just, just that's right. Very slowly move toward your ears. And just kind of, that's right. Right up close to your head, slowly. Very closer, closer. Right, right up. Yeah. Right up. That's good. And just kind of feel that for a second. That's good. And then just slowly move away. Unpack the feel. That's it. There you go. She's laughing. You, she, you're playing with your aura. <laughs> yeah, actually, I felt you feeling it. My hair stood up when you did it. You did it better than I did it. <laughs> anyway, so if you, you know, and as you have more and more bliss experience, your DNA gets braided more and more recursively, and you feel charged more sensitively because your blood is bending magnetism, and that's called sangreal, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So. The ability to make living electric fields, we have a whole series of technologies involved around this, and we have the imploder, and we have the purify, and we have the acosify. You can read all about it on the website. And you can make a device which does the same thing in water, and we have a 30 to 200 percent in growth when we implode water like that, in that same spin path we've been talking about. And then we take the output of that and we put it to what's called phase conjugate magnetics, which I invented, which is where the like poles of the magnet attract. And, and in that geometry, the rotating water molecule goes through an intense magnetic Z pinch and you, the molecular cluster size goes way down and so you have solubility increase. The water feels silky and that solubility increase equals growth food for plants, it's a very wet water. <laughs> it's, it's very soluble. And that also has implications for fuel treatment and um, uh, feeding animals and swimming pools and solubility and then atomization for pre-treatment of diesel fuel for trucks and all kinds of things. Just because you implode, spin the water and the water becomes stable as a monomolecule. The metaphor for that is um, actually the same Ark of the Covenant story that if you took one of the originals for this design, it's a phase conjugate dielectric capacitor which is otherwise known as the Ark of the Covenant. It's a gold and acacia wood in the correct proportion with the correct scale to be an implosive capacitor. And this was used, the spark here, would do the same thing for a gold atom that I'm doing to a water atom. It becomes stable as a mono atom. And that's how the Essenes under Akhenaten and Moses made lots of money. They made the gold powder. It was served in a round white wafer later called Holy Communion. And you eat the gold powder and your eyes turn blue and you live forever. But there's only one little detail, <laughs> some addiction and some other problems. <laughs> uh, however, um, this uh, gold powder story uh, then gets back to our story of the moment, which is alchemy. So, once upon a time, there was a giant capacitor, a big square black capacitor called uh, the Kaaba of the Muslims. A big square um, black meteoritic stone. And there was a one of the guys who owned it for a period in the early medieval history was called the Mad Caliph. And he allowed some of the local alchemists to grind up the black meteorite to be the philosopher's stone, the projective powder, the miracle of alchemy. And um, the reason that that particular meteorite could be the philosopher's stone how many of you have heard of the Philosopher's Stone in alchemy? Yes? Do you, do you know what that is? The Philosopher's Stone? If you get a little bit of that powder, you can make gold. <laughs> There's gold in them, our hills. So what's the physics? 
The physics is that in a particular kind of meteorite, and only one kind, a meteorite made of glass, mostly glass, that when the meteorite is coming through the atmosphere, the temperature is so great that all other met metals will vaporize and literally disappear. But there's a certain few metals which when they vaporize, they will diffuse completely through the glass and not disappear. And those metals are called the PGM, platinum group metals, palladium, platinum, and gold. Just like gold vaporized through glass is how the Templars made the dark red glass of the stained glass Gothic cathedral windows. At any rate, so when one of these metals was present in the arriving meteorite, it made a dark red glass called the Kaaba, the sacred stone of the Muslims. And it made a glass that was a phase conjugate dielectric. And so it projected an electric field that was fractal and bioactive. And so you've got a little bit of that glass ground up in a powder and you used it properly, you could make gold. So, back to our story. Hundreds of years later, there was just a little bit of that ground up powder and they, you can study the history, they actually ground up as much as half of the volume of the original Kaaba, sacred black stone of the Muslims, disappeared from history. Where did it go? Somebody was making lots of gold. This is all a true story, by the way. So, this guy named Kelly happened to come across a little bit of this special white powder. <laughs> And this guy, Kelly, was trying to make a deal with this guy who was the Einstein of his age. His name is John D. Anybody here ever heard of John D? <laughs> Pretty famous guy. When John D was the chief spy for a lady named Queen Elizabeth, and John D sent letters to Queen Elizabeth signed, For Your Eyes Only, and he wrote, the symbol for her eyes, and then a symbol for her eyeglasses. And if you look at it the other way, it reads 007. And it's true. John D. is the original 007. Real history. Well, John D. had the largest library on planet Earth at the time, and he was the Einstein of his day, specialist in hypercube four-dimensional mathematics. And so Mr. Kelly arrived at John D.'s house and knocked on his door and said... I got the gold powder. I have the Philosopher's Stone here. I'm willing to sell it. <laughs> and so they had a little deal they made. John D. says, well, I got this other problem you can help me with. He says, I learned how to read most of the languages on planet Earth, and I got bored. And I said, I'd really like to talk to the angels. And so one day, a, a, an angel knocked on my window, his name was Ophanum, or Uriel, I think, and handed me a green stone, which you can still see in the, in the British Museum today. And in that green stone, if you look at that stone, if you look inside the green stone, you could see the plasma residues, I mean the phosphine flares, I mean the shadow of electromagnetic donuts, I mean residual magnetism, I mean the alphabet of angels. Oh. And so John Dee's problem was he wasn't...